So I'll record this. So the question was, what are the dimensions associated with an SCIRS model? And what I said is, we don't really ask that question that way. You, you know, what are the dimensions of a model? We ask, what are the dimensions for the state space associated with the model? State space is a space where each point in that state space characterizes the state of that model. And the state of a model is defined by its stocks for a stock and flow model. So um, a given point in state space um, will have a, have a value. It'll be, for that point in state space will be a coordinate for each stock, a coordinate for S, a coordinate for I, a coordinate for E, and R, and S. Um, well, we already said S. Um, S E I R um, in general. Um, and, and so those would be the structure of that state space would be, we would have a four dimensional space S E I R S. Now, again, if you said, aha, we know people on the model, no one's coming in, no one's leaving the model. They're all just going around in this grand cycle. So we know the population is constant. So all we really need to know is S-E-I-R, sorry, S-E-I, and we can compute what S is, or sorry, what R is. Um, um, then I'd say, well, okay, you know, so, so really intrinsically, it may have four dimensions, S-E-I-R, but it only exercises, it, it only has three degrees of freedom. It only exercises kind of three independent dimensions. The fourth one is given by that. So it's like a plane in four dimensional space, which is admittedly um, not something probably you folks spend a lot of time visualizing. Um, um, so it, it only occupies, actually it's like a three dimensional volume in four dimensional space. Um, so there's only, Three S E I R, for example, or sorry, S E I, they vary, and you can compute R from it. But but in general, it'll be one dimension for each state. Um, in general, and unless there's a special case that you know that they sum up to you know some particular value, so all you need is 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 the others, and and that last one is given. Um, so you're quite safe in general saying it's you know one one coordinate in the state space for each state variable. And uh, movement of the model over time will be a trajectory in state space. So it'll be like a um, path in the state space. S will be changing, I will be changing, E will be changing, R will be changing. So it's moving in state space moving around and maybe it goes into the vortex state um so um that's a little bit about the kind of the dimensions of that um that state space i was joking about the vortex there could be a vortex state. there could be many equilibria when you have a nonlinear model one of the consequences are you can have multiple of these equilibria you can have multiple places where it's in balance mm. um Okay, so there's a question about assignment three, question one. Let's see if we can go take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I welcome these questions. These are great. Um, assignment three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, these were fun ones. Well, oh. okay. Um, Okay, um, so let's go go have a look. Graphical integration, here we go. Mm. Um, okay, so what is the stock going to do um, as a result of each of these? Okay, so suppose that we start with $0. Day zero, we have ten dollars in and zero dollars out. How many dollars are in the account 
after that first day. So if we started with zero and day, day zero, we have 10 in and zero out. How many do we have at the end of that day in our account? Anyone? How many? So ten dollars came in and zero went out. How many more do we have at the end of that day? If ten dollars came in and we didn't take any out, how many more dollars would we have in that account at the end of that day? Hmm? Yeah, ten. What do you mean no change? Like it went from zero. We started at zero. And went up to 10. From zero, got it, got it. Sorry, I thought that we started from $10, sorry. Even if it started from 10, it'll be going up by 10, right? So like 10 more come in during that day. So it's gonna go up. It's like net flow of 10 in. Just like in that other, other thing here is net flow of 10, right? Uh, or net flow of 10 minus five. I mean, it's the same same concept. Like it's going up by 10. How many? How many is it going up? the next day day one um well we have some number come in and we have some number leave but the difference between the two is what guess what what's the difference on the, on day one between these two what's the net net change it's what what does it mean that these are parallel the net change is mm -hmm. Same as before. Yeah, it's $10, $10 difference here, $10 difference here per day. So after two days, it'll go up by 20 from its initial value. After three days, it'll go up by 30 from its initial value. It'll keep on going up by $10 a day. That's why it's you know, 10 more dollars. For every day, 10 more dollars come in than leave during that day. So it's going to be going up by $10 a day. So after 20 days, it'll go up by how many dollars? Mm -hmm. After if it goes up by ten dollars a day, after 20 days, how many dollars is it going to go up by overall? Yeah, 10 times 20, 200. Exactly right. Exactly right. 200 dollars. It increased by 200 dollars over these 20 days because every day went up by 10 dollars. That are seeing the inflow and the outflow. Mm. Mm. Um, well, let's talk about another one. Maybe we'll do this one. This one's like, sorry, let, let, let's do, ah. uh, let's do this one. This one's less sort of crinkly than this one here. We'll come to the, you can come to the crinkled one if there's demand for it later. Um, Okay, um, so, so um, here we have inflow being blue, again, as above, we have outflow being red. And we start with $20 in this. So in this first day, um, we have some amount of outflow that's greater than the inflow. The difference in the outflow and the inflow is 10. What does that mean? The number of dollars in the account will go what? By $10. 20 minus 10 is outflow minus inflow. So we had started with 20. What will it be at the end of the first day? It will have gone what? Yeah, it'll go down from 20 to 10 because we lost $20, we gained 10, it's a net loss of 20, right? We, we got 10 in, but we had 20 out. So it's a net loss of 10. So we went down from 20 to 10. In that first day. The second day, do we lose 10 as well? Anyone? Do we lose 10 the second day? 10 more? we'll come to that. Look, I want to show the reasoning. That's more important than the, the picture. We lose less. Darn right, you lose less. And, and the third day, 
do we do we lose 10 for the third day so here's day zero day one day three, day two um so if we consider the third day zero one two um do we lose 10 um a net 10 on that day anyone uh we will lose less and less until we darn right darn off. right you lose less and less so when will the when will we lose well when will we have a day where we have no change in the value of the stock it won't be going down anymore when is that yeah day five it's the day they cross right yeah. day number you know day time equals a month five month five they they they're equal so whatever dollar value we started with on that day will be the dollar value we on that month will be the dollar value we have at the end of the month what will it do all through this period all through this period it's going to go what it's going to go yeah it's going to be a net increase because every day the inflow is greater than the outflow and is it going to be going net increase in a straight line or is it going to be yeah be going up in value will it go up in a straight line will it go up kind of in a diminishing way or will it go up in a faster and faster way that was a question will it be going up slower and slower or, or faster straight line no it will not go up at a straight line Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Uh, maybe I didn't really mention it really correctly in the words. So the way that it works is that as we saw from the uh, fifth day first, it will getting lo less and less. But now, since that time has passed, it's the space between them is will be increasing more and more. And so, well, uh, it means that the line is going to go sharper, higher. And uh, right. that trying to say, uh, sorry, if, if the yeah. sentence that's exactly right it'll be it'll be going up faster and faster so to look look it'll look something like this mm -hmm. um okay um so you're going to start with some dollars here right and it's going to start coming down with a slope of, of 10 per month. But each successive month, it's going to go down. It's going to be flat when in month five, right? Um, when there's no net change. So, so this is, this is uh, month five, right? Um, uh, this is month here, and this is five here. Um, um, we can barely see the board. If you maybe you should tilt the yeah. Now we can see it. Now we can. See. Okay, so this is month five. So it's going to look something like this. It'll come down here. I'll 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 draw it a little bit more. It'll go like this, and then it will go up, and it will go up faster and faster. Right? Um, it's going to be going. It's not going to be going up linearly. Linearly would be if inflow. Is, minus outflow was con or constant and it'll be going up like like if if outflow inflow minus outflow were five it will be going up by five dollars per month the amount in the account will be going up by five dollars per month instead it's going up faster and faster can we have a our our profit is going up per month we have more and more coming in net net more and more coming in per month um so maybe the first month it is you know, one net dollar uh, per month coming in, and the next is two, and the number is three. So it's going up faster and faster. The, the bank account is accumulating money faster and faster. It's a parabola. It's a parabola, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the minimum of the parabola is here, and you know, drawing it down and and drawing it up. And you know, one way to see this is, I mean, it's all nice and good to be to have these two curves but you could subtract the two right you can always look at inflow minus outflow and what you find is it's a line right inflow minus outflow is a line um 
um, you subtract these two, you'll get a line. Um, uh, that'll be the net flow. Um, and, uh, and, and that line, it will not be a flat line. It'll be a, be a line at a, at a certain angle. Um, it'll be s sloped upwards. Um, so if you have inflow minus outflow, you know, at, at month zero, it'll be minus, minus 10 and, and then it will go up to zero by month five, and then it will continue up uh, successively. And it'll be month 20, by month 20, it will be inflow minus outflow or 30 minus uh, zero. So it'll be 30, but it's a line going upwards and that's the net flow. And, um, and, and so this stock is accumulating that, it's integrating that, it's, um, uh, the, the derivative of the bank account, the, the rate at which it's going up is given by that net inflow. And so you could figure that out there. Um, yeah. Um, so, so this crinkly one, I mean, this one here, look, I mean, um, this crinkly one, when is, when is this bank account going to be in balance here when is it going to be well let me ask this when is it going to be going up uh over time when is the, when is the bank account going to be going up over time can anyone tell me from day five through what what's the last day where it'll be going up over time day 15 day 15 is right day 15 five through 15 Mm -hmm. what what's what's the special what's so special about day 10 it's going up what it's going up it's going up faster going up fastest it's going up fastest here it's going up most quickly the the slope is steepest there at this point the slope of the bank account will be zero. At this point, the slope will be what? It will be low. It'll be zero, zero, right? The slope oh, will be here. zero here, here, yeah. Here, it'll have a negative slope. That it'll be going down. Right? The bank account will be going down because we have outflow greater than inflow or inflow minus outflow is minus five. So it'll be going down, right? Here it will be flattened and here it will be going up faster and faster because the net inflow, inflow minus outflow will be getting faster, you know, bigger and bigger. So it'll be going up faster and faster, right? It's like more and more water is coming into your bathtub than is going out each time. Maybe in the first minute you have you know, one liter in and zero liters out. And in the next minute, you have two liters in and zero liters out. And the next, you have three liters in and zero, be going up faster and faster. And then it will be going up slower than that, that peak. And it will be, you know, coming down and it will flatten out. And, and then it will start to come down. And then it will it'll be going negative again. Yeah. Um, I had a question. Yeah. Um, on the B, um, so at the end of the day, it, it started with $20 and it ends with $20. Am I right? Because since yes, if you want- Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. It's totally symmetric. <laughs> it has to be that way. Yeah, sure, sure. sure. Um, so it's going to be um, like uh, this. So look, um, the, the total area under this above the curve is- is equal to the total area below the curve. So it's 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 symmetric. So yes, it's gonna start with 20. It's gonna go down initially. It's gonna go flat at this point. Then it's going up faster and faster. And then it's going still going up here, just slower and slower. And then it's gonna be flat. It's not going up anymore. And then it's going down here and it's gonna come down to 20. Yeah. It's it's not it looks sinusoidal. It's not it's not truly sinusoidal, but it's it's not a sinusoid. The the 
the derivative of a sinusoid it would be another sinusoid. I mean, derivative of cosine is a, it, yeah. Um, derivative of cosine is a is a, a sine and and so on. So, um, uh, uh, no, the derivative of cosine is minus sine. What am I doing? This is like horrible. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but basically, sinusoids. The derivative is another sinusoid, and and you have to reason about the negatives uh, in there. Um, derivative of sine is 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 a cosine. Um, and um, uh, and so yeah, it's not truly sinusoidal. It's um, but it's it has that sort of aspect where it sort of goes down initially and flattens out and then comes up quickly it more and more fast and then more and more slow and then it reaches a maximum and then it goes down again and so it has that kind of feel to it of kind of a sinusoidal aspect yeah 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 got it thank you okay mm. Mm. can i re-explain the term uh, okay, I think it referred to as being heterogeneity. Um, it's a character, it's a group of agents or entities that are different from the rest of the population generated dynamically by them all. When I talk about heterogeneity, I'm talking about differences in the population or you know, amongst what's being simulated. So let's suppose it's a population of people. I'm talking about differences in the people. So commonly when we're dealing with you know, situations in the world, we have differences in the things we're characterizing. So it might be for people, a difference in age or a difference in self-identified gender, or maybe it's a, a difference in people's uh, uh, income levels, or maybe it's a difference in their education levels, or maybe it's a difference in, in their, you know, their height or, or what have you, um, uh, their health status, um, you know, whether they're COVID, in fact, you know, they, Never gotten COVID before. If they um, are they at an you know early stage of COVID infection, or they at you know a, 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 a medium a medium stage, a late stage, uh, they recovered, or you could characterize them based on vaccination status. Um, it's it's sort of a way of 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 characterizing differences between within the population, and in a if, if we want to characterize, let, let's suppose another way we could characterize people is like um, whether or not they were born in Canada, right? Um, yes or no, for example. Um, and, um, and so you could, uh, you could divide people as to whether or not they're born in Canada. Um, uh, and uh, in a population of, of uh, People like in a in a system dynamics model, maybe maybe we want to track the spread of infection among those who are Canadian born versus others. Um, so if we want to do that in a system dynamics model, each stock susceptible, infected, recovered, we need to keep track of susceptibles born in Canada and susceptibles not born in Canada. Infected born in Canada, infected not born in Canada, recovered not born in Canada and born in Canada. Um, and, and we would need to have flows of people getting infected who are born in Canada and another flow from the stock of people born in Canada to, uh, who are susceptible to the stock of people born in Canada are infective. And similarly for those not born in Canada, the stock of susceptible to the stock of infective. And similarly for their recovery, a separate flow for each. So we, we Conceptually, we double the size of this model. We have stocks, SIR for those born in Canada, and we have SIR for those not born in Canada. And conceptually, we'd need to reflect the fact that people who are born in Canada could be infected by those not born in Canada and vice versa, right? Um, so when we have a system dynamics model, in general, if we introduce heterogeneity, we introduce these distinctions we wanna capture in the population say whether people are born in Canada or not, we, we have to increase the size of the model. We like double it for a distinction of two. If we want to capture people into 17 different age groups, 
zero to four, five through nine, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, et cetera, um, all the way up to 85 and 85 plus or what have you, 17 age groups, we'd have to multiply the size of the model by 17 times because each stock S would need a stock of susceptibles zero to four, a stock of susceptibles five to nine, a stock of susceptibles 10 to 14. We, we multiply the size of the model by 17. I suppose you wanted born in Canada and age now by 17 for, to capture the age categories by each of those into two groups who are born in Canada and not. And you've got a model now where each stock in the original model, like susceptible, has 34 darn stocks, one for each combination of those. It, it scales very awkwardly. It multiplies the number of compartments that you have to keep track of, the number of stocks and the number of flows between them. It's, it's, it's sort of, you get all combinations of them. Now, if you, if you had a, an agent-based model, by contrast, um, uh, you, you don't do it that way. You don't have to divide agents into buckets you know, have a different group of agents born in Canada, a different group of agents not born in Canada. No, no, no. Each agent just keeps track. What's my age? Could even be a continuous age, right? Doesn't have to be zero to four, five to nine, but, but I could keep track of my continuous age if I wanted to, um, like 2.4, you know, 53.4, whatever. Um, and uh, keep track of, was I born in Canada? For me, it would be no, it was not. Um, so, you know, each of these, um, each agent would, would know that, um, whether they're born in Canada or not and what their age is, right? Um, and that doesn't double the size of the model in general. In fact, it, it commonly increases it by a quite modest amount, um, adding in another distinction. Basically, you like if it's a binary distinction, you add one bit to each agent, right? You just keep track of one, one extra bit of information, zero or one, with respect to are they born in Canada or not, or what was their sex at birth, or what was their, you know, um, uh, are they, um, you know, are they uh, working or not? It would just be a distinction of zero or one, let's say. Um, um, so it's, it's actually very little extra information. It doesn't double the size of the model when you keep that level of heterogeneity like it does with a stock and flow model. Um, so, you know, in, a, in an HMAS model and discrete event, in fact, as well, we keep track of these distinctions among agents, this heterogeneity by attributes of the agent, not by putting them in different buckets, but by sort of tagging each agent with a little bit of extra information, like an extra bit of information. Or if we need to keep track of 17 distinctions, we need five bits, right? Um, it almost fits into four bits, which would be 16 categories. Um, you know, so in general, we don't have to um, double the size. We just keep track of a little bit more information about each agent. That's why adding heterogeneity, adding more distinctions into an agent-based model is easier. We can also keep track of people's history. Like, did they ever get infected before? How many vaccines, you know, when was the last time they got a vaccine or how many, what's their vaccine history? How, when did they get each of their vaccines or how many previous times have been they infected? Whereas in a system dynamics model, gosh, it's horrible to compute, man. I'm gonna get up a stock. This stock of people are, were recovered and have zero previous infections before this one. Um, you know, before the last one. And this one is people who had one before this last one and two before this, it would be horrible, you know, to keep track of history um, of people in a stock and flow model. It, it just, it, it does not scale, I'd say. So heterogeneity, keeping track of distinctions among people, age, like an individual level model, agent-based or discrete event simulation is a much better match, okay? These are great questions. Just going back to the state space. Um, uh, yep. Um, yeah, we just need to add a single property. Yeah, exactly. Um, just going back to the state space for ABM. My understanding is dimensionality is based on on states. Yeah. 
Um, okay, okay. So, so here's the thing. Um, it's a very good question. Um, it's good for you to know this. Um, for a a system dynamics model in state space, nominal state space, sort of naive state space, and you'll get a long distance with this, really long distance. The rest is kind of the exceptions. But long distance, just realize for each state variable, each stock, there'll be an axis of state space. So if we have an S, I, R model, there'll be an axis for R, S, for I, and for R. Um, uh, in general, in general. Um, if you say that to me, I'll be very happy. If it's an S I E I R S, you know, you have four stocks S E I R. Naively, the state space would be S E I R, or four dimensions, one for each. And again, that, that, you know, that there's these special cases when it's a fixed population. Um, it doesn't go up and down, then you don't have to worry about one in stocks. But but basically, it's the rule is one for each stock, and maybe you don't have to count the last one because the total of the population is fixed. Now, for an agent-based model, the situation is more explosive. Um, let's consider two agents. Maybe each agent is in one of two states. S, I, or R, each agent, one of three states, right? S, I, R. The number of possible states that that whole model could be in, well, the first agent of the two could be an S, I, or R, and the other agent of the two could be an S, I, or R. So collectively, there's three times three, right? Um, the first agent be an S, be an I, and be an R, and independent of that, the other one can be an S, I, and R. And so there's nine combinations, right? First S, second, and the first one is an S, and the second one is an S, or first one is an S, the second one is an I, or the first one is an S, second one is R, or the first one is an I, and the and the second one is an S, and the first one is an I, and the second one is an I, and the first one is an I, and the third one is R. Oh, sorry, the second one is R, not the third. Don't get confused about that. Or the first one could be an R and the second one could be an S. So the first one could be an R and the second one could be an I. The first one could be an R and the second one could be an I. It's nine combinations count. Um, hmm? um, so, um, so when you have N agents, here we have two. It's three times three, or three squared, three to the two. If we had three agents, it would be three times three times three, right? 27, right? Three times three is nine times another three is 27. And in general, if each agent could be in three states and you have n agents, it's three to the n number of possible logical states this model could be in. The, the number of possible states goes up exponentially or geometrically with the number of agents. Each added agent adds another three times the number of possibilities, right? If you have a thousand agents, like three to the thousandth power, which is big, bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. Actually, is that true? Um, yes, it's true, I think. Um, so estimated number of atoms in the universe. So it's big, the number, number of possible states it could be in. Um, now, that's the number of kind of logical different states, the number of distinct states it could be in. I'm not quite comparing apples with apples because when we have a SIR model, we can have actually like it's it's not integer states. It, it's it's in um uh in, in in states that are like real values three three hundred point two or something. But um 
the number of states in an ABM grows exponentially. It grows, grows geometrically. Um, each new agent multiplies the number of states by the number of states per agent. Um, this can be explosive in its number of possibilities, but we don't have to consider all possibilities for an agent. Like we don't have to list them out or something. It's not like this is debilitating. It's just like you can't possibly, for realistic models, plot out all possible states for it. Um, you could summarize them, right? You could always have a pseudo state space plot. It's kind of a state space summary plot where you count the number of susceptibles agents, count the number of infected, count the number of recovered agents. But that's not the full state of the model, you know, because like a, a value of, you know, um, let's suppose there's two agents, um, Mary and Jill, um, uh, you know, a, 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 if we have a summary of, of their state, of, of their, of, of the model state of zero susceptibles, sorry, one susceptible, one infective and zero recovered, it could be that Mary is susceptible and Jill is infective and no one's recovered. Or it could be that Jill is, in, is susceptible and Mary is infective and zero recovered. Either of those would show up as you know, uh, one susceptible, one infective, zero recovered. So in general, I think when we have a agent-based model, we, we can't generally depict all possible states of the model. It's just too big. It, it grows too quickly for realistic population sizes. That's not debilitating. It's not a problem, you know, in some big way. It's just we, we can't draw a nice state space plot that completely identifies the state of the system. Whereas in the system dynamics models, talk and flow model, we can generally like one point will specify there's this many people susceptible, this many people infected, this many people recovered. That's the total state of the model. This number, you know, this value in this state stock, this value in this other stock, this value in this recovered stock. Whereas an agent-based model, at best, we we often summarize it, and it's not a complete summary because we don't know if Mary's infective or Jill is infective. All we know is one person is infective. So state spaces for agent-based models tend to be explosively large, and we can't, you know, show a complete picture of it. Um, we can at best do a, a summary of it. And if you can understand that, you'll be well ahead of the game for this exam. What I've just discussed is, you know, about as far as I expect students to understand about, about that. Okay. I do expect you to know, like in state space, um, you know, like in a true state space, uh, as, as the model runs, it etches out a trajectory. It kind of moves in state space. Um, I actually have pictures of this. And, um, we're, we're running low on time here, but um, uh, it's because of these great questions, but I'll, I'll show you a picture. You know, it'll be better than seeing my face for you. Um, um, so um, ba -ba -ba, let's, let's, let's see. Ooh, ooh, there's a lot of good things here. Ooh, ooh, ooh look at all these things. Ooh, 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 yeah, that's great stuff. Um, mm, mm, yeah, yeah, you should know some of these things. Um, um, mm, where's a where's a picture of a state space plot? I know I have it in here somewhere because I looked at it before. Um, it's uh, it's coming up. Ooh, ooh, there it is. Like this is a picture of a state space plot. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, like the, a given run of the system goes like it's like rolling a marble it rolls along here and kind of follows these flow lines and these flow lines anyone know where those come from why is this pointing in this direction anyone know where that comes from those those flow lines it says go if i'm here go this way Go this way, go this way, go this way. From here, go this way. Where do those come from? Anyone want to guess?
Okay, it's a good question. Where is it in equilibrium? Where is this thing at equilibrium? Can anyone spot the equilibrium here? Where's Waldo? Where's the equilibrium here? Hmm? Anyone want to say? Where's the equilibrium? The part that we see that the kind of the blue line goes near. Yeah, it goes right here. Yeah. It's not increasing and it's not decreasing. It's kind of focused on this point. It stays at this point. Mm. Um, here, the angle of the this line or the where this is going, the fact that it's going down is because this derivative is negative. It's going down. Um, it, it, it's going down. It's, the value here along this axis is going down. This is the y-axis. This is the x-axis. This is a state place plot. Remember, there's a dimension here for each state of the system, x and y. Um, these are the stocks, x and y. And um, so this is x, this is y. So here we have y is going down and x is going up or down? Is X going up or is X going down? If it's pointing kind of that way, is it going, is X going up or going down? This is the X axis. So is it going up or down? Is it, is it pointing in the direction of greater X or is it pointing in the direction of lesser X? Less x is darn right, pointing slightly to the left, right? And it's, it's pointing down as well, but there's a component of it pointing to the left. It's not pointing to the right here, it's just pointing to the lower left, right? Pointing down, so it's going down in y, and it's going down in x, so it's pointing there. That's because these derivatives, the rate of change of x is negative, so it's pointing in the negative direction. Here, and, and the rate of change of y is negative. So it moves in a direction of small towards smaller x because the slope, the derivative of x is negative, meaning it, it's going down over time. It's getting smaller. And the derivative of y is getting smaller. And so it's going down. Um, so it points in the area of going down in y, down in x, because the derivatives are negative um and it comes down here and remember i mean it's part of the nature of these systems that the flows depend on the stocks the, how the system is changing depends on the current state of the system so as you change the state of the system as there are fewer infectives and more susceptibles or whatever the rates of change you know, if there's no susceptibles left, you're not going to get any infections. If you have lots and lots of susceptibles and lots of infectives, you can have lots of infections. So the current state of the system dictates how it's going to change. And so as the state of the system evolves, how it changes is different. And it follows these flow lines, which just graph out, show how X is changing. So here... For this one, it's X going up or down for this arrow here. If we were at this state of the system, we put a marble here, it's gonna follow this line. Is, is X gonna be going up or down as it's kind of rolling in the line, the direction of this arrow? Is, is X going up or down? Roll in that direction, is it going up or down? It's going up, darn right it's going up. Okay, up, up, <laughs> good, good, uh, up, 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 up. That's great, awesome, awesome. Is it going, so it's going up in the X, in the X direction, pointing slightly to the right. And is it going up or down in the Y direction? Mm. Um, it is going up in the Y direction, darn right. Um, so, so the derivative of, of x is positive. It's going up over time. Remember the derivative, so how quickly is it increasing over time? 
and revolve y is going up over done. Right? And so it's pointing this way upwards. How if it were pointing totally to the right? How if it were pointing just to the right, neither up or nor down? What would that be telling us? If it's totally pointing to the right, what would that be telling us? The rate of change of x is what? If it's pointing to the right, is the rate of change of x positive or negative? If, if this arrow were, oh, oh gosh, I'm having trouble seeing this chat. It's, um, um, I think it, uh, most people said no change, except so someone said positive. So. Well, but but wait a minute. I mean, if it's, I said, is the rate of change of X positive or negative? If it's pointing to the right, it's no change in X? Hmm? Um, if it's pointing to the right, there certainly is change in X. Is it negative or positive? Positive, darn right it's positive. It's pointing in the direction it's increasing, it's going up. The rate of change of Y, if it's just pointing to the right, it's not going up or down, it indicates the rate of change of Y is zero. It's not going up, not going down right now. It's just shooting out there. So how about this one? This one's going, looks like pretty much straight down. What is that saying? The rate of change of X is what here? Anyone? This, this one here, we're going straight down. The rate of change of X is what? Zero, darn right. Rate of change of Y is, is Y increasing or decreasing? Decreasing, it's going down and going down and Y, right? Um, yeah. Going down. There's a negative. Over time, going down, right? Ten more dollars are coming up per month than are being put in. It's going down over time. The rate of change is minus 10, for example, of, of, of this. And and but if it's vertical, no, no change in that at all. So this is what this is. So if you put a marble anywhere here, you roll it, it'll follow these things. That's a state space plot. I wish we could do this for me, ABM. The best we can do is to kind of summarize it with something similar. Mm. Okay. What other questions are, are there that I can answer? This is this is great. I, I love these questions and I want to answer more. Um, so what other questions do you want to know about? Yeah, I'll post these slides. Um, um, discrete event modeling. Every entry, every entity and resources is state. Okay, this is a good question. For discrete event simulation, situation is more subtle. Um, we have entities, which are these quantities, these actors that flow through the workflow process. Um, and we have resources which govern their flow. And if we want to summarize the total state of the system, we need to summarize a lot of things. We need to specify where each entity is. And, and what happens What happens in a discrete event simulation when I told you that in a discrete event simulation, we have, um, I don't know if I have a picture of this. In a discrete event simulation, we have a, um, we have a situation where uh, agents, or sorry, these entities are progressing along these structured workflows. Um, and their progress along the workflows is governed by the availability of resources, like a nurse is available, or a procedure room is available, or a hospital bed is available, or something like that. Um, and uh, if a resource, is not available, what does that agent do? Suppose the agent wants to be seen by the doctor and the doctor is not available, what do they do? What happens to them? What happens to them?
What happens if that resource is not available? It will either wait or leave. I mean, now they'll wait. They'll wait in a queue. They'll wait in a queue. Yeah. Now, some of those queues are balking and they can leave. Um, but in general, they'll wait in a queue until the resource is available. Um, but, you know, it's possible they could, um, in, in some cases, that they may leave because the resources doesn't become available in a certain time. Um, so the main way that agent, that entities interact, remember in agent-based modeling, you, you know, it's something similar in the sense you have individual actors. Um, there it's agents, here it's entities and discrete event simulation. The difference is in agent-based modeling, the focus is often on their interaction, interaction with each other and the environment. Um, it's one of the differences. It's less specialized. Speci uh, it, it, discrete event simulation is more specialized for kind of this issue of structured workflows and, and resources. And, um, and the, the way in which entities interact, the way in which they interact in discrete event simulation is what? Anyone? How do entities interact? In, to, well, tell me, do they interact at all? Does my presence as an entity Im impact your situation in the uh, structured workflow? If so, how? Does my flowing through the system, does my being in the emergency room affect how soon you will see a doctor in the emergency room? Darn right it does because I take up the resources. I keep you waiting, right? Um, I take that emergency room bed. Maybe I'm in a more serious situation, so you wait longer. Mm -hmm. um, they interact through resources. They typically don't infect each other. They don't whisper messages to each other or inspire each other generally in discrete event simulation. They keep each other waiting. They, one gets the resource before the other and the other has to wait. They wait in queues. So in discrete event simulation, the state of the model involves kind of where those eight entities are in the process, but also just, you know, which ones are in which queue waiting um, um, and the amount of time until the next one can be seen. So it's actually a more complicated thing. It has to do with it's more advanced topic. Um, um, and how many resources are currently in use and to what entities they're currently bound. They're currently seized by certain entities. That's a more advanced thing I'm unlikely to ask about, but um, the, the state of a discrete event simulation is, is, is quite a bit more textured because um, it has to do with who kind of has allocated certain resources right now, um, who, uh, you know, what, who's in what queue and how long that person undergoing a certain procedure will until they're done to the next person is seen, et cetera. Um, yeah, these, um, these are all part of sort of the state of that system. Mm. Um, okay. Um, somehow I'm, I'm getting kind of a delayed sense of the chat here. Um, okay. Um, so, so I'm not seeing full chat. I'm not sure what's what's going on here. Um, I see. Um, okay. Um, yeah. The question is, what's the the dot on top of the S N I N R? Um, here we go. What are what are these dots? What's a, what's a dot above S signaling? Tell me. What does that signal? Um, people should be able to tell me. I'm gonna log in with my phone again so I can see this chat better. Chat here is for the birds. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, so what is what is that? Yeah, it's the derivative. This is the rate of change of this. How quickly this is going up or down per unit time. S dot is the rate of change of S per unit time. Dot specifically means Per unit time. You could write DSDT, it would be equally good. Um, dot is more specialized to mean specifically, it's, it's always time, T. Um, so you can write DSDX or DSD, 
V or whatever, but but S dot is always with respect to time. That's how we use it. Um, and so it's a little bit more compact to write that. This is the rate of change of this. Um, if S is not going up, what is this equal? If, if S is not going up, it's not going down, what is S dot? It's equal to what? Darn right, it's zero. Mm. What is what is i dot equals ten mean? What does it mean if i dot equals ten? Let's suppose in time is measured in days. I dot equals ten. What does it mean? The number of people infected is doing what? It's no, it's not necessarily the rate of new infections per day. No. 10 more people. No, no, no. It's not 10 more. It's not 10 people are infected per day. No, no, it's not that. You're close, but, but you're missing a key thing. It's increasing by 10 people per day. I, I'll tell you, it, it could be increasing by 10 people per day. Um, with 100 people getting infected per day, as long as how many people get it are recovering per day? 90, right? If, if this is 100 and this is 90, 100 minus 90 is 10. I will be going up by 10 people per day, right? Uh, still, it doesn't say that the number of people being infected per day is 10. It says the difference between the number of people being affected per day and the number of recovering per day is 10. It's, it's the same thing we, oh, I'd love to explain that to you, but um, we don't have time. Um, so um, uh, where's my, where's, where's my, um, come on, come on. Um, we're, we're going back to this, right? And it's the same, same same thing we did before, right? Um, so if I say the number of people, um, number of people who are in the hospital is going up by six, that doesn't mean the number of people coming into the hospital on that day is six. No, 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 no. It's, the number coming in minus the number going out is six for the number of people going, for the number of people in the hospital going up by six in that day. It could be a hundred people come in that day and you know, 94 of them leave, right? Um, uh, that would be, it would be on, on, on net, six more people at the end of that day. It could be a thousand people come in and 994 leave on that day. That would also be a net change of six, right? Um, you start with six more in there, then and you began with that, you began for that day. Um, so the rate of change is it's not just the rate of change of I is not just the number of new infections, it's new infections minus new recoveries. That's the rate of change of this. That's a that's a key point. And um, remember that. What does this term correspond to here? What is what does this term correspond to? Tell me where that is in this model. Could someone say that this term here? Where does that come? Of course, what does this correspond to in the model? Where is it? Is it this thing? Is it this? What does that correspond to? This term. Yeah, it's the force of, oh, okay. What, what is C times I over N times beta? What is that? What is that? What is this? C times I over N times beta. Leave out the S for now. Just, just this thing. What is that? That is the what?
It is the force of infection. Yes. Don't, don't look at me during the exam to expect me to be doing that to you. <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that. Okay. That's the force of infection. C times I over N times beta. What is the force of infection? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. What, what is the force of infection? Intuitively, what is it? It's the chance per unit time that people will get infected. The probability per unit time someone will get infected, right? Like 1% chance per day, right? 50% chance per day. That could be a force of infection. So, so this is the force vector, C times I over N times beta. What is C times I over N times beta times S? That's, wh where is that in this model? Where is it in this model? Tell me where it is. Hope we don't have to have an Easter egg hunt here. What, where is this? Where, where is, where is this, this term corresponds to something in the model? Is it the total population? Is it the waning of immunity? Where, where is it? Where, where can I find this term? What does this term correspond to in this model? Oh, come on. Come on, where, where does it correspond to in this model? Yeah, it's the flow between S and I. It's this flow here. There's a force of infection times the susceptible. That's exactly what this is. What does this term correspond to in the model? So by, by the way, this is an inflow to infective. What does this term correspond to in this model? Yeah, the flow. Yeah, so what is, the, what is, what is that? I over tau term. Where, where's that in this model? Is it here? Is it here? Is it, is it this thing? What, what does it correspond to? Point out to me where this term is. Yeah, from infective to recovered, done right. Yeah, this is a good way to have participation in this class. I'm, I'm looking who's, who's speaking up. This is awesome. Um, good stuff. Um, note taken. Um, so, so this corresponds to this, this flow. That's the outflow. This uh, other one corresponds to this, that's the inflow. So this has a positive sign. We don't write it, but it's a positive sign. This is a negative sign because it's a flow out of I. This is a flow into I. So it has a plus in front of it. Flows in and positive, and flows out and negative. And collectively, the sum of the inflows minus the sum of the outflows. That's exactly what's here. Sum of the inflows minus the sum of the outflows gives the rate of change of the stock, right? So if this is 100 people, if this is 10 people coming in and four people leaving, 10 minus four is six is the net change in I, right? It's how quickly I is going up. If this is 100 people getting infected, 94 people recovering in that day, 100 people getting infected per day and 94 recovering per day, it goes up for that day, goes up six people per day as well. This is a thousand people getting infected, a nine out of ninety-four are getting recovered. It goes up by six people per day. It's the difference between the inflow and outflow. When will this stock be in balance? When will this stock be in balance? When what equals what? When will when will this be not changing? When what equals what? Please, please, when will that not be changing anymore? Yes, the inflow equals the outflow. This will equal this. And so this minus this will be what? This minus this at that will be equal to what? Zero, darn right it would be zero. Inflow equals outflow. Um, 
can you go over the definition of basic reproductive number? Why is it not different from the SCIRS number? Yeah. What is a basic reproductive number? Who can tell me what's a basic reproductive number? What's the basic reproductive number? You heard about it through the pandemic if you're reading news and pandemic, listening to news. What's the basic reproductive number? What's the basic reproductive number? Surely someone can say. Number of infections, the first infective infects, and an otherwise totally what? Susceptible population. Good, darn right, darn right. No, it's not the mutation rate, but, but I give you, I give you credit for saying something. That's great. Um, um, yeah. It's, how many people? And it, uh, a single index infective, a starting infective, one single infective, and otherwise susceptible population will infect before what? Before they what? Is it the number of people they infect per day? No, no, before they recover. So over the entire time of their illness, how many people do they infect? They're surrounded by others who are susceptible. Everyone they meet is susceptible. How many people do they infect before they recover? That's the basic reproductive number. When will an outbreak occur when that's what? Bigger than one or less than one? It will occur when it's what? Greater than one, darn right. So let's suppose it's two. Each infective infects two people. So by the time, so they start infective. By the time they recover, they've infected how many people? Two, right? If it's two. And each of those people before they recover, if it's a really big population, basically everyone they see is gonna be, so, so just about everyone. So roughly be two there. Um, and so those one turns into two, turns into four, turns into eight, turns into 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 496. 8192, et cetera, right? Just keeps on going. As computer scientists, you should know those numbers. Um, yeah. So it it doubles, it it grows, 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 grows. Look, if they infect fewer than one person by recovery, it'll peter out, right? Maybe they'll infect one person, but you know, they it'll basically die out. It, it can't sustain itself. When they recover it. They'll generally not even be infecting one person, one stinking person to replace them. So it'll tend to die out. That's the basic reproduction. Now, how would I calculate that? Well, look. Look at this. Look at this. So look. Let's suppose we have one infective in the population. How many people are they going to infect? Let's think it through. How many total people do they infect or do they meet per day? They meet C people per day. C total people, maybe it's a hundred people they meet per day in total. They're riding the bus to Place Royale, they're going to classes, et cetera. Maybe they meet 100 people per day. By the presumption of the basic reproductive number, all those people are susceptible. So not only are they meeting 100 people per day, they're meeting 100 susceptible people per day. And each of those people has a certain probability of what? Of being infected. Where can I find that in this? What is it? Where is it? Where's the probability? 
per contact between a susceptible and infected that the person's going to be recovered. Where is it here? It's staring us in the face. Where is it? Yeah, it's this B, weird B thing called beta. Okay, they're going to be meeting 100 people per day total. Each of those people they meet is susceptible by definition for the basic reproductive number. And, they're, and for each of them, they're going to have a chance of infecting that poor person, a beta. So they're going to infect per day C times beta people. C times beta people per day. Okay, I've got an audience here. Um, uh, C times beta people. So maybe they meet 100 people per day, and each of those people, they have, you know, a uh, 20% uh, chance of infecting. So 100 times 0.20 um, be 20 people per day. Wow. Um, that's, that's people per day, they're affecting C times beta. Now, if we want to know how many, the basic reproductive number, what do we still have to take into account? We have to take into account how what? Because the basic reproductive number, how many people they infect, is it per day? Is that what the basic reproductive number is? Is that what it's asking? No, it's until they recover. And what's their average time to recover for this model? Where could I find that? Where is that staring me in the face? It's this tau. It's this tau thing. This is the mean time. Remember, this is a first order delight, right? I divided by tau it's because this is the mean time there. So, so um, it's tau. So the total number of people that they infect is what? For, oh, for their entire course of their illness, it's C times beta, which is C times beta is the number of people they infect per day because they're seeing C total people, hundreds times and beta chance per person that they meet, that they infect them 20%. So C times 0.2 is, is 20 people per day times the number of days they're infected. So maybe they're infected for five days, right? So each day they infect 20 people and times five days and infecting 100 people, five, 20 times five. Mm -hmm. That's the number of people they infect. Now, the question was, well, why is it? Not different for an SEIR model. Okay. Suppose suppose we had a E compartment. Suppose we had a E compartment stuck here. So maybe they get infected and they go to an E state. And they're not infectious for a while. They're infected, but not yet infectious. And then they transition to the infective state. Doesn't really in fact, it doesn't really change how many people they infect or the entire course of their illness. When they become infective, they meet with C total people by assumption, all those people are susceptible. Each of them, they have a chance well, for each of those people of infecting a beta. And they stay infected for tau amount of time. So the fact that they passed before, they passed before they got infective, before they spread it, they were in this exposed state. Isn't doesn't really change how many people they infect on average um, before they recover. It just delays when they will infect them. They won't infect them immediately upon infection. It'll take some time before they develop the high viral lo loads to, to infect people. So it's still C times beta times tau. It's just they'll be infecting people three days later rather than immediately. They'll be, and they'll still stay infective for stay in this state. They'll be an E state over here between infection and infective. It will flow into E and then it'll flow out of that into infective, but they still stay infective on average for tau time. And while they're in the infective state, they'll infect C times beta people per day because everyone else is susceptible. So that's why it's the same. I don't know if that helps. Riddle me this, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to have to go soon to get some water because I, I need to slake my thirst. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to need to get some water shortly. But um, let's, um, let's ask, what's... 
So we talked about the basic reproductive number. What's the effective reproductive number? So, well, at this time, whenever it is, not, not, not at some time where everyone else is susceptible, it's right now, given the number of people that are susceptible right now, um, how many people will they infect before they recover? And that'll be, for the models we're dealing with, it'll be C times beta times tau times the fraction who are infective. Sorry, it's a fraction or susceptible right now. So it's, it depends like how many people are on the infected. Let's, let's suppose that right now, not everyone is susceptible. Only half the people are susceptible. Well, imagine you're an infective. You're surrounded not by everyone being susceptible, but only half of them are susceptible. Well, you'll infected, you'll no longer infect C times beta people per day because half of them are, are not people you can infect. So be, C times C times well, C divided by two, half half of them, right? Susceptible people you infect times beta times tau is the number of people you infect. So in general, it's going to be for this model, it's going to be C times beta times tau times the fraction that are that are susceptible right now. And can anyone give me a formula for the fraction that are susceptible here? If I had to express it as a, as a formula, what would it be? The number of people, the fraction of people in the whole model that are susceptible. I'll note that the entire population model is given by N. So what's the fraction that are susceptible at a given time? Anyone? Yeah, S over N, darn right. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah, good job. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, yeah. So C times beta times tau times S over N will be the effective reproductive number. Now, this model, when it's in balance, when this model's in balance, what do we know about inflow? What do we know about infection and recovery? When this model's in balance, at a population level, what's, what's the case? We think about the number of people getting affected per day and the number of people recovering per day. What is it that will lead to the effective state be, being in balance? If what, at a, at a population level, what is it? What's the condition under which the infective state will be in balance? If what? is the case. Uh, no, no, it's not S plus I equals R, e equals R. No, 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 that's not, not the case. No, no. The infectives will not, will not be in balance if, if S, I, and R are equal, you know. No, it's not I not equal to zero. No, when will this stock not be changing? When will it not be changing? If what? You told me many times earlier this session, when will this not be changing? If inflow equals outflow, exactly. Well, at a population level, if, if infections, the number of people getting per day infected equals the number of people recovering per day, right? If, if this equals this, this minus this will equal what? If the inflow and the outflow are equal, this minus this will equal zero, right? And so this stock won't be changing. And so the population level, at an individual level, at, in, when infection equals recovery, the number of people per day that getting infected equals the number of people per day they're recovering. How many people, if 
does an infective infect before they recover? They'll infect how many people before they recover? At that critical point of balance, when, when the, the number of infectives is not going up, it's not going down, each infective infects how many people before they recover? One, one person. They basically replace themselves, right? It's like they nominate someone to take over their position when they recover, right? They're gonna infect you, right? Infect them when they recover. They just replace them. And, and number of infectives is not going up or not going down. They just, it's like a, a baton pass. They pass the baton of infection to someone else, right? Number of infectives is not going up, it's not going down. It's not like they infect two people and those infect two, and two, and two, and it grows, grows, grows. No, 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 no. It's, it's, they infect one person before they recover, they recover, that person carries on the tradition and they infect one person, recover, and on average, they infect one person before they recover. And so that's when it will be a balance at an individual level. You could think of it at either at the population level, flows are equal, or you could think of it as, at the individual level, how many people do they recover? One person will recover when it's in balance. Hmm? Hmm. 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 The number of infections, people getting infected per day is bigger than the number of recoveries. What is infective gonna be doing? The number of new infections per day is bigger than the number of recoveries. What is infective going to be doing over time? What is it going to be doing? Going up, going down. It's going to rise, darn right, it's going to rise. So 10 people getting infected and five people recovering per day, it'll be increasing. Yeah, going up by five per day. There ain't this is bigger than this. This is 10, this is five. 10 minus five is five, and the rate of change of I will be five. We'll be going up. Mm -hmm. If outflow is greater than inflow, we'll be going down. When will the number of infectives be the maximum when what equals what? When, when will infectives be maximum? The number of, at the maximum number of infectives, it won't be going up anymore. It's been going up and now it's gonna go down. What is the case? What's the rate of change? At that maximum, what's the rate of change of infected? It is, yes, inflow equals outflow, yes. Remember like that diagram we saw before? Remember that? that diagram we got that great question why why is it the maximum there it's a maximum because it's been going up before here before inflow was greater than outflow so it keep on going up going up and then until this is the peak right this is the peak of it where it's not going up anymore at that point it's not going up anymore to add a maximum there because before that inflow is greater than the outflow after that flow be greater than the inflow. And this is where it's, it's reached that peak, like that curve I drew on my blackboard. And after this, it's gonna to start to go down. So at that point, you know, when infectives is at its maximum, it's not going up, it's not going down anymore, right? It's, it's flat. That's when it's reached its peak. And then it will start going down. Mm. Mm. Um, do I have a nice, Graph of it, I, 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 I don't. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 right there, right? Right there. It's at its peak. Inflow equals outflow. How many people is it infective infecting at that peak? At that, at that peak of the maximum number of infectives, how many people is the infective infecting before they recover? Speak on, use, as in one voice. How many people are they infecting before they recover? I think I'm gonna go get a drink of water while you were you ponder that. Um, Thank you. 
So what's the answer, ladies and gentlemen? How many people is the infected we're covering on average when the number of infectious people is at its maximum? How many people are they infected on average? Oh no. How many people are they infecting before they recover on average at that maximum? One. One stinking person is right. That's right. 9,500, it's like, well, it's actually 450, but I mean, you don't have to worry about it, but I mean, it's not the value of this. I'm asking how many people does each infective infect before they recover? It's one. That's why it's flat. At this point, it's flat because it's not going up and not going down anymore. At its peak, it is flat as Saskatchewan. It's not going up, it's not going down because each person is infecting, it's just passing the baton to someone else to be infected when they recover. Number of people infected is not going up, it's not going down. What, what's also the case here? What's also the case here? At a population level, what is the case? If infectives is not going up and it's not going down, you looked at that diagram before, I can go back to it. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm showing this one for, 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 for this model, which is slightly different. But at the point where I is at its maximum for this model, what is, what is the case? What it, at the point where uh, I is at its maximum, what's the rate of change of I? I is at its maximum. Yes, infectives equals recoveries. Yes, the rate of change of infectives is zero. It's not going up, it's not going down, it's staying the same. Inflow equals outflow. Good. This is a model where you have something like, um, where you have that people getting infected. So for this, it's, it's, it's a model like, oh, come on. Well, I, I might as well do this because it's, it's this sort of model, right, right here. Uh. Okay, there we go. Let's just copy this down there so you don't have to get confused by it. Okay. Uh, too many things to go over. Um, here we go. Come on. Come on. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Okay, let's save this. So if you have this sort of model, why is susceptibles dropping? This is susceptibles in blue. Why is it dropping at first? Why, why is that start high and why is it dropping? What's going on? What's going on? Why is it dropping at first? Look, if a stock is dropping, what do we know about it? We know in terms of what? In terms of outflow and info. Yeah, people are getting infected faster than they are what? Losing their immunity, maybe because no one's starting infect, it's starting recovery. Yeah. Um, it's not shown here, but yeah. Number of susceptibles goes down and and, and and red is the number of infectives. The number of infectives goes up and it reaches the peak. And at that peak, the rate of new infections equals rate of recoveries. Mm -hmm. Inflow equals outflow. That's why it's flat there. It's not going up anymore, right? 
staying the same. It's the same old stinking thing as, as what we saw here, right? There, it's not going up anymore. Inflow equals outflow. If inflow were greater than outflow, it would be going up. It ain't. So inflow equals outflow, it ain't going up anymore. Um, and at that point, one, the, an, an average, a given infective infects on average one person before recovery. And the level of susceptibles at the, is at its lowest point at this time where the infection is sustainable, where it, it can support the fraction of people who are susceptible is enough to ensure that, one, that an infective infects one person. That's what's going on there. Susceptibles is a fraction of susceptibles in the population is such that an infective will only infect one person before they recover. Mm. Do you remember before when we, when we talked about that? I apologize, but I, I, I want to go back to the slides we were, we were talking about it for. For which we were talking about it. I remember when we were talking about this before. What did we say the basic reproductive, or the basic reproductive number, which here was what? Who could say? What was the basic reproductive number? Number of people they infect before they recover in an otherwise totally susceptible population. What was the basic reproductive number? Give me the formula. Right? Yeah. You said it before. You should remember the reason. C times beta times tau. Darn right. They affect they they each infective has contact with C total people. Um, for the basic reproductive number, we're assuming they're all susceptible. So they have C C susceptibles they meet per day. Each of them they have a chance beta of infecting. So C times beta is the number of people they infect per day times tau. It's how long, how many days they're infected. So C times beta times tau is the basic reproductive number. Remember what I say, what's the effective reproductive number here? And C times beta times tau times what? Remember I said it before? Times, we have to take into account for the effective reproductive number, we have to take into account the what? Yes, the fraction of people in the population that are, in, are susceptible, right? If only half of the people in the population are susceptible, then they're only going to infect half, half as many. If one tenth of the population are susceptible, they'd only infect one tenth of what they would otherwise. Because nine out of 10, if their contacts are duds, right? I'm not talking about clothes. I'm talking about, you know, the, the, they can't infect, right? Um, and, and so, the, the effective reproductive is C times beta times tau times S over N. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we stand or sit at the cusp of greatness. Because at endemic equilibrium, at equilibrium, when the number of people, in, when the number of infectives is at a peak, what do we know about the number of people infected by a given susceptible, a given infected before they recover? What is that when the number of infections is at a peak? What is it? When the number of infection, infective people, sorry, the number of infective people is at a peak, it's not going up or it's not going down. Inflow equals outflow at a population level. And for a given infective, they infect how many people? If it's not going up, it's not going down. They infect how many people before they recover? Remember the baton race? One, 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 one. They infect one person before they recover. Just said what the effective reproductive number is at that point. It's one. They infect one person before they recover. So, see. Times beta, times tau, it's basic reproductive number times S over N. That's the effective reproductive. C times beta times tau times S over N is equal to one. So what does that imply S over N is? If 
C times beta times tau times S over N is one. What must S over N be? What must one S over N be as a formula? If C times beta times tau it times it is one. S, S over N must be what? What must it be? One over C times beta times tau, exactly. C times beta times tau times S over M is one. S over N must be one over C times beta times tau because C times beta times tau times one over C over times beta times tau will be one. So that's must be what S over N must be. And what is C times beta times tau? It's the what? C times beta times tau is the, give me a name for it. It has three words in it. Basic reproductive number, R0, R0, R0. They pronounce it in English. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm no longer at the cusp of greatness. We're, I've arrived at greatness itself. Because at, the point where the system is in balance at the point where the number of infectives is not going up or going down anymore. The number of susceptible, the fraction of susceptibles in the population is one over the basic reproductive number. And that guarantees that each infective infects one person before they cover. Because normally they would infect in a totally susceptible population are zero people, the basic reproductive number. But if the fraction people around them that are susceptible is one over the basic reproductive number, they'll infect one person. So if they would normally infect 20 people in a totally susceptible population, but only one twentieth of the people around them are susceptible, they'll infect one person the fraction of people who are susceptible when they infect only one person is one over the basic reproductive number. So let's go back to the diagram. There we no, no, not that one, this one. So tell me, at that peak, how many people does each infective infect at that peak? How many is it that they infect at that peak before they recover? How many? How many people do they infect for, for each, where it's not going up, not going down, the number of infectives, it's not going up number down. How many people are, is each effective infecting at the peak? One is right. That's why it's not going up and not going down. You could also think about it in terms of inflows and outflows, but let's focus on this individual level. You can infect one person before they recover. And the fraction of the population that's susceptible there, that is susceptible at that point is what? I said it earlier. I said, the fraction that are susceptible at that point is what? It's one over what? One over the basic reproductive number, darn right. And here, the number of people, and here also the number of people infective, red, is not going up or not going down. And the fraction of people who are susceptible in population at that point is what? It's not going up and not going down. What's the fraction of people in, uh, who are susceptible at that point where it's, the infectives is not going up and not going down? Fraction of people susceptible is what? At that point. Say it again, Sam. What is it? Yes. No. No, it's, it's not the S equals N. No, no. No, the, the fraction of people that are susceptible is not. If S equals N, I mean, everyone's susceptible. 
means like there's nobody anything but systems <laughs> at the point where this is the maximum. Uh, there's some people infected. I mean, look at the diagram. Um, there's some people infected. The, the, the susceptibles can't be everyone. The fraction of people who are susceptible at the point where the number of infectives is not going up and not going down is what? It's What is it? What is it? Oh. <laughs> you think you have to restart your brain here. Imagine you after three hours of this exam. Um, I'm, yes, it's one, the fraction of people that are susceptible at the point where each person in, <laughs> look, if the number of, Infected people is not going up or not going down. How many people is each infective infecting before they recover? One, darn right. And for that to be the case, the fraction that are susceptible is what? It's the fraction of people that are susceptible in the entire population is what? It's one over the basic reproductive number. That's why they only infect one stinking person. Otherwise they'd infect if it were all susceptible, they'd infect the basic reproductive number. So if only one over the basic reproductive number of people around them are susceptible, they infect one stinking person. You get, you get it? Look, if, if only half the people around me were susceptible, let's suppose I, and basic reproductive number is 20. If everyone around me is susceptible, 100% are susceptible, I infect 20. It'd be like measles. Let's suppose only half the people are infected or are, are susceptible around me. I'll infect 10, 20 times 0.5, right? Suppose 20% of the people around me are infected, only one out of five of them. I'll infect 20 divided by five, right? Or four people before I recover. Now suppose that one over the basic reproductive room, one over 20 of the people around me are susceptible. If everyone was susceptible, I'd infect 20, but only one over 20 of the people around me are susceptible, I infect one. And that's what's always the case when the number of people infective are flat, the number of, um, it's flat, the number of people or the fraction of, uh, fraction of people who are infective will be one over the basic reproductive number. That's why the number of infectives is not going up or down. If each person is passing the baton to one other person and the inflow is the equal to the outflow for, for infectives. That's why it's also not going up and down, but you could think of it at an individual level. And when it's flat here, what's the fraction of the population infective? Or sorry, susceptible. What's the population fraction of the population susceptible um, at this point uh, when the number of infectives is in endemic equilibrium, when it's in balance? What is it? What is it? The fraction of people that are susceptible here is what? Look at that. The number of infectives is flat as a line. Each person infecting one person. So what's the fraction of the population that are, that are susceptible? Say it one more time. Play it again, Sam. One over basic reproductive number. Exactly. You got it. By the way, I welcome everyone putting forward answers. Look, it's, uh, it's great that people are putting these forward and I value all those answers. And I give you, I, I, I will check what the names are and view that towards participation. It's a great thing. So don't let my, my enthusiasm for explaining this uh, dissuade you. Um, great job, people putting solutions forward. That's construction, even where they're, they're off base. Uh, it, that's how we, we learn in life, we, we fail forward, fail early, fail off. And it's by doing that we learn. So, so don't let my comments uh, dissuade you. But ladies and gentlemen, when the number of infectives is not going up anymore, you could think of it as two ways. One, inflow equals outflow from the infective state. Number two, 
we could think about each infective infects one person before they recover. And this fraction, when it reaches equilibrium, this fraction when each infective is only, is, 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 the number of infected not going up or down, each, each infective is just has a baton pass to the next one. They nominate one person to take over and they recover, so to speak. And the fraction of people in, in, of the population that remain infected is one over the basic reproductive number. So if we have a disease like measles, whose basic reproductive number is around 20, I mean, 18 has been estimated in England, et cetera. Let's suppose we say 20. That means the number of people, if it's in equilibrium, the number of people around who are susceptible to measles is about 5%, one over 20. And each person gets measles to pass on to one person before they recover. Right. Um, that's, that's the idea here, okay? Um, so why is the number of, so let's, let's consider this diagram. So the number of susceptibles comes down at first. You told me, why is that? I asked you, and you told me it's because people are getting infected. And I said, yeah, more people are getting infected per day than are waning immunity per day. And so it's dropping, right? Outflow is greater than inflow. That's why it's dropping. Why is it rising here? Why is this rising? Why is the number of susceptibles rising here? Can anyone say, let's go back to that diagram. Why is that rising? Why is the number of infectives rising if what is greater than what? If the number of like, uh, I think it, one, bec maybe because of waning of the immunity and one yeah. because the number of susceptibles also increasing and the number of like recovered is getting reduced in the same time. So well, I yeah, but basically, so, so there's a bunch of things occurring at the same time, but basically it's because for susceptibles, look, if the number of susceptibles is going up in the population, the inflow to susceptibles has to be greater than the outflows from susceptibles. You know, some of the inflows is minus the sum of the outflows has to be greater than zero. That's why it's going up. And so more people per day are waning immunity at this time than are getting infected. And that's why it's going up. Now, notice that we've reached a peak in the number of infectives here, where inflow equals outflow, where you know, for, for infective, where each person infects one person before they're recovered, right? And then the number of infectives drops. Why is the number of infectives dropping here? Why is it, why is it dropping? Like, why is it going down here? Why, why, why is this dropping? I mean, we reached this peak and the number of infectives, infectives all around, we are strong, we are legion, right? Lots of infectives are out. Why is it dropping after that? Why would a stock drop if what is the case? The reason I think it's because of the, well, as one person mentioned, outflow is- Yeah, the, the outflow is greater than the inflow. More people are recovering than infected. We have all these infectives, so lots start to recover. And we have more people recovering per day than are getting what? Than are getting infective per day, right? Getting infected per day. And so it's going to be dropping. Um, and, and you notice it's dropping. As it's dropping, so is what, what else is dropping here? Um, what else is dropping um, after that? At the peak, this number fraction of susceptibles was at this equilibrium value, it, which is just here. I mean, it's the same value as over here. It's the same value that's reached at this peak. But um, and the number of susceptibles is dropping here. Why is the number of infectives is dropping? Why is the number of susceptibles dropping also? Anyone say like, like you, would, you might think like, wait a minute, that's weird. The number of infectives is dropping, but susceptibles are dropping also. Why, why is that possible? Why, why would susceptibles be dropping even when the number of infectives is dropping? Why, why would susceptibles be dropping? Well, if susceptibles is dropping, what must be the case still? What well, must be the case? If the number of susceptibles is dropping, let, let's cut through to the very simple explanation. If the number of susceptibles, it's a stock, 
If the stock is dropping, what must be the case? Yeah, people, well, no, the number of susceptibles has nothing to do with recover. Recover is over here. Why is the number of susceptibles dropping for this period? If a well, stock not, is dropping, what does it mean about the flows? I mean, there are not a, a lot of people remain that are susceptible. Most of them are infected already. Uh, why is the number of susceptibles dropping? What, if a stock is dropping, what does it tell us about the flows? Please. Outflow is greater than inflow. So if, if the number of susceptibles is dropping, I, I want you to get this point really clear. If the number of susceptibles is dropping, it tells us what about, about the situation? That the number of infections is what? Is still what compared to number of people losing immunity? Number of infections is what compared to the number of people losing immunity per day? It's higher. Yeah, we have more infections going on than we have people losing immunity. That's why this is going down. Look, there, don't we could we could, you know, talk about all of the other things, but that's the essence of the situation. Outflow is greater than inflow. And the outflow here is infections, and the inflow is this. And if this stock is dropping, it's got to be that the infections per day are greater than the waning of immunity, people waning immunity per day. And that's why that's dropping. And the fact that that is dropping, the number of susceptibles is dropping. The fraction of, means the fraction of susceptibles in the population is dropping. What does that mean to how many people get infected per day? Per, per, per infective out there. As if the fraction of people are susceptible around them, for each infected it becomes harder and harder to infect someone, right? Because it was maybe half the people around me were infected. And now it's like, a quarter of the people around me, oh, sorry, susceptible. Now it's a quarter of the people around me are susceptible. And now it's maybe a tenth of the people around. It's getting harder and harder for me to find someone to infect, right? So as the susceptibles drops, it makes the job of each infective harder to find someone to infect, right? And so the, the number of infections here occurring is going down for two reasons. First of all, infectives itself is dropping because more people are recovering than are getting infected. And for this, so there's fewer infectives to infect people. And per infective, it's getting harder and harder to find susceptibles because susceptibles is going down too. Susceptibles are getting harder and harder to find. I just need to find that person and give my baton to, and it's becoming harder and harder because everyone's already been infected. And it's, it's harder and harder for me. And so this you know, further drives down the number of infectives. The number of infectives is being depleted by recoveries and it's being depleted because it's harder and harder for each remaining infective to, to infect someone. So that's driving down and the number of susceptibles is going down with it despite that because it, there's more people getting infected than are, uh, you, you might think, well, the number of infections is dropping. So of course, susceptibles should no longer, um, why are susceptibles going down still? Well, it's, this is dropping, but it's still bigger than the waning of immunity per day. So susceptibles is gonna be going down. You can have this flow out of susceptible be going down, but it's still bigger than this flow, waning of immunity. So susceptibles is still going down, just going down slower um, uh, over time. It's going down you know, getting less and less slow. And it goes down to a minimum. If we consider, remember blue is susceptibles. See that bottom? What, what, what does it mean? When susceptibles is flat at the bottom, what is it telling us about the model in terms of flows? If susceptibles is flat, it's not going up, it's not going down. It's in balance. What does that tell us about flows? Um, with respect to susceptibles. The number of what equals the number of what? I'm rehearsing these points of strength. If a stock is not changing, what does it tell you about the flows? Yeah, the waning of immunity equal, equals the, the, the rate of infection. Yeah, it's, it's not that the waning of immunity equals the number of infectives. No, 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 you're, you're, you know, that would be, 
saying that this flow equals this stock. They're totally different dimensions. This is a people per day. This is people. It, 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 you don't compare those. You, you say the two flows are equal. I can understand why at this hour, particularly you'd say infective rather than infection, but it's these two flows have got to be equal if it's not going down. And I think that's what the person meant, right? At that point, those two flows are, are, are equal. And then why is susceptibles rising here? If a stock is rising, what does it tell us about its flows? If the stock is rising, if the blue is rising, blue star rising, if this is going up, susceptibles is going up, what does it tell us about the flows? What is it telling us about the flows? Inflow equals growth is greater than outflow. Waning of immunity, more people are losing their immunity per day that are getting infected. And so, so the number of susceptibles is going up. Notice the number of infectives is still going down here. That doesn't hurt, right? Um, when of immunity is number of people to infect them is, is going down and, and, and the number of susceptibles is going up. You might think the number of susceptibles going up should drive up infections, but notice infections is still going down here. Why is infections still going down? Even when the number of infectives is, or susceptibles is going up, you would think, oh, there's more people for me to infect out there if I'm infective. The number of infections should be going up. Right? Number of infective people should be going up, but the number of infective people is going down. Even when the number, the number of infections, yeah, yeah, we're we're in trouble. Um, I'm gonna stop.